The difference is voluntary submission. Somebody puts a yoke on you, you can only do what they allow you to do. Because the yoke keeps you from doing what you want to do. Involuntary submission. But Jesus says he wants us to voluntarily take on a yoke. A yoke is designed to control. So, why would we want someone controlling us? Jesus says my yoke is easy. There's an interesting word here. Incidentally, think about this for a second. I don't see many people commenting on it. Jesus grew up as a boy in a home where the father engaged in a trade. Do you recall what the trade was? He was a carpenter. When I went back to Israel in 2014, I went to a reconstruction of Nazareth Village, which would be, was the village that Jesus was raised in. And one of the things I saw there was a reconstruction of a first century carpentry shop. Now, carpenters didn't build houses because they didn't use frame construction. They built houses with stones piled up on top of each other. But when it came time to put in a door or put in shutters or put on a roof, the carpenter was called in. That's what the carpenter did. When it was time to build furniture for inside the house, the carpenter did that. That's what the carpenter did. But what the carpenter did most of all was he made implements for farmers to use because the Israelite community was an agrarian society. And that meant he built things like plows and yokes. Here's Jesus, commonly called the carpenter's son, and he says, I know how to make a yoke. Think about it. You've seen yokes on animals. You've seen pictures of yokes on animals. Now, have you ever noticed that they don't just take a four by four and lay it across the necks of two animals and put a couple of U-bolts in it. Have you ever noticed they don't do that? Why do you suppose that is? Because if the animal's working against those rough edges, what's going to happen to the animal? The animal's going to get chafed. He's going to get injured. He's not going to be able to work, right? When you talk about the iron yoke of oppression, they didn't care if those fit. They didn't care if they were comfortable. They didn't care if you chafed wearing that. But a carpenter cared if the yoke fit well or didn't fit well. And so there might be a basic construction, a basic design of a yoke, but then the carpenter would take that yoke, put it on top of the animal that it was going to be placed on, and the carpenter would smooth things out so the yoke didn't cause any chafing or any injury to the animal. Jesus uses a word here that's very interesting. The one translated easy is the word krestos. We would spell it C-H-R-E-S-T-O-S. -S. It's just one letter different than the word for Christ which is Christos. Christos. What did that word mean? When you used it of something like a yoke, what it meant was serviceable, fitting, tailor-made. That's what it means. And so, I, if any, how many of you, were, were any of you raised out in, on the farm? You always put the same animal on the right, the same animal on the left, right? You didn't ever switch them around. Always the same animal on each side. Why? Because that's the way the yoke was designed. It's designed as custom fit for the animal. And what Jesus is saying is, you can take the iron yoke of oppression, you can take the iron yoke of involuntary servitude, where it's put on you and you don't have a choice in the matter, or you can take the yoke that is custom made for you, well fitting, custom made. In fact, William Barclay, years ago in his commentary, suggested this. I don't know where he got it, 
But he suggested that maybe the reason Jesus uses this is because it's kind of a, an advertising tool that a carpenter's shop might advertise, my yokes fit well. And that's what Jesus is saying. My yoke fits well. His yoke is easy. The authority of Jesus is kindly, loving, and gentle. And what he invites us to do as his people is to voluntarily take a yoke that is perfectly tailored for us. That's the difference. Voluntary submission to Christ or involuntary slavery to something else. But what is that something else? Well, Jesus goes on in verse 29 and changes the metaphor a little bit. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. Do you see that change of thought? Our minds are what is under the yoke, so that our thoughts, our opinions, our views, our whole way of thinking is subject to the mind of Christ. This morning, John was talking about this in Colossians chapter 2. How do you know what is right and what is wrong? You test it by the mind of Christ. Can you see Jesus doing the things or thinking the things that you're doing and thinking? Learn from me. Now the Jews understood this concept and they spoke of the law as a yoke. Did you know that? They spoke of the yoke of the law. The idea that the yoke of the law bound you and it constrained your conduct, it made you do what you didn't want to do and made you not do what you did want to do. It held you in. That was the idea. The yoke of the law. Jesus comes along and he says, it's not the law that's oppressive. It's the things that they've added to the law that make it oppressive. In fact, one of the passages John looked at this morning Matthew 23, verses 1 to 4. Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. I never knew what that was until I went to Israel. Inside the synagogues, and you can still find it in synagogues. There was one in, uh, in um, um, where was it? Chorazin. Chorazin. The Ra Remember Jesus said Chorazin of Bethsaida, woe to you. If the miracles had been done to you in Tyre and Sidon had been done in you, they'd have repented a long time ago. Remember that? In Chorazin, there is a synagogue, and inside the synagogue is a seat. I actually sat on it. It was called Moses' seat. It's the place that the person sat who was presiding over the synagogue service. Now, the original one is in the museum because they, didn't, they know what people are like. Okay? So they took the original and put it in the museum. I sat on a replica. When he says the teacher of the law and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, he's saying this. They sit and watch over everything that happens, and they decide what's right and what's wrong, and they make sure you dot the I's and you cross the T's in your worship just so. And if you don't, they're the ones who are going to call you down for it. So that's where Jesus says, they're the authorities. So you must do, be careful to do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. What do I mean? Here's what I mean. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. They're putting yokes on you that they won't wear. That's what he's saying. Jesus says, on the other hand, learn from me. In the place of the burdensome yoke of the elders, Jesus offers an easy yoke. But there's a subtle change of metaphors. He starts off talking like a carpenter or a farmer about a yoke, and now he changes to a teacher. Learn from me. Jesus is our Savior and his teacher. We're his students. Now, which would you rather be, a slave or a student? Jesus uses the picture of a student, a disciple. That's what a disciple is. That means we have to bring our minds under the will of Christ. 
2 Corinthians 10 verse 5. It does make a difference what you think. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. As Christians, under Christ, we are to actually give thought to what would Jesus say? What would Jesus do? What would Jesus think about the way we're conducting ourselves? Early Christians were happy to submit to Jesus. They called themselves slaves of Jesus voluntarily. The theme of submitting ourselves to the mind of Christ is not a very popular one these days. We don't often hear people refer back to Scripture to justify their opinions and their conduct. We hear more often that they justify their opinions and their conduct by quoting public opinion, maybe citing you know, social media or something like that. The theme of submitting to Christ. But do you remember that story where Jesus is in the home of Mary and Martha? Remember that story? And Martha's the... She's the type A personality. She's just like I am. She's always doing something. Mary can tell you. If we've got the television on, I'm still doing something. Constantly. Probably working on a sermon or a Bible class lesson. That's probably what I'm doing. But I'm always doing something. I can't just sit down and do nothing. I'm kind of like Martha. But where are the Marys? The ones who are sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to and drinking in His words. And learning from Him. That's what Jesus says. We need to flood our minds with the Word of Christ, with the thoughts of Christ. Sadly, I fear that most average church members don't really desire that strongly to bring our minds in submission to the teaching of Jesus. We prefer our own opinions. And instead of a thus saith the Lord, we're more prone to say, I think. We listen to it in Bible classes. How many times the determination of what's taught or what's thought is I think this and I think that instead of here's what the Scripture says. The only place to discover the mind of Christ is the Bible. And if you don't spend time in the Scripture, you can't know the mind of Christ. We have to bring our minds under Christ's yoke. We have to bring our wills under Christ's yoke. That means we have to want to do what He tells us to do. Matthew 7, Jesus says this at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Remember the children's song, the wise man built his house upon a rock? What's Jesus say? He's saying, being a disciple is more than an intellectual exercise. It's a moral exercise. We have to hear His teachings, and we have to obey His commands. And the distinction here is between the one who hears and obeys, and the one who hears and ignores. We don't like that word. Obedience. We don't like that word. And yet, that's fundamental. John says it this way, we can be sure that we know Him if we obey His commandments. Being under Christ means my mind is subject to His mind. My will is subject to His will. And in the New Testament, that's the way to freedom. To those not having the law, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 9, 21, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. It's no longer law that's written on tablets of stone. It's now law written in our heart. And it comes from, securing, from, from focusing our minds on the mind of Christ. Have you submitted to the mind of Christ? That's the fundamental question of Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30. Have you submitted to the mind of Christ? Well, test yourself. Are you in business? 
Do you engage in shady practices? Do you take advantage of people? Do you make sure that uh, you write your contracts just so that you can wiggle out of doing the right thing? How about your sexual practices? Do you engage in sex outside of marriage? How about same-sex conduct? If you're pregnant, would you consider an abortion? How about your marriage? Do you flirt with spouses of other people? You thinking about having an affair? If your marriage is going through a rough time, would you contemplate divorce? You see, a Christian is someone who submits mind and will to Jesus. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. That's what Jesus said in John 13, 13. As a teacher, Jesus instructs us. As Lord, He commands us. That's what a Lord does. It is inconceivable that a Christian would disagree with Jesus or disobey Him because He is teacher and Lord. Teacher and Lord are not honorary titles. You know, some people don't go to college but they get honorary degrees or maybe ornery degrees, I don't know. <laughs> teacher and Lord is, are not honorary titles. He either is or He isn't our teacher. He either is or He isn't our Lord. And if we disobey or disagree with Him, we lose our credibility. Why do you suppose so many people in the world have such a low opinion of Christians? Isn't it because so many Christians don't live according to the Word, don't believe according to the Word? They disagree with what Jesus says, they disobey what Jesus says. Submit to the authority. That's being under Christ. Submit to the authority of God and His words. It's a matter of conversion. Our minds are not converted unless they're in submission to the mind of Christ. Our wills are not converted unless they are in submission to the will of Christ. So the fundamental question is this. Who is the head of the church? Is Christ the Lord of the church? Or is the church the Lord of Christ? <coughs> will you listen obediently to Jesus? Or will you ignore Him? We're not going to have an invitation song today. The reason we're not is there was a time when invitation songs were very effective and there's a time now that it isn't and invitation songs aren't anything that's scriptural or unscriptural as far as that goes. The Bible doesn't say a word about them. But there was a time when people often would come down to the front and they would have prayers or they would say I want to be baptized or something like that. We're not inclined to do that so much anymore but that's fine. It's okay. Because what I see happening more often than not these days is someone, as we saw last week, grabs an elder and says, I need prayers. And John Burton comes down and prays for Jose and his family. Or, as happened last week, Lynn brings Deborah up to John and me. And we talk to her. And she says, I want to be a part of this congregation. So we introduce her this morning. More often than not, responses don't come during a time of an invitation song. So we're not going to be doing those, at least for now. But that doesn't mean that there's not an invitation. It's just that the invitation isn't confined to three verses. It's always there. But we are going to end with a prayer. I commend this prayer to you. Let's pray it together. God, today I submit my mind, my eyes, my mouth, my ears, my hands, my feet, my heart, my whole life to you. Use me for your purposes. In Jesus' name, amen.
if you have the communication